We are into tracking this wounded bear for three or four hours at this point. It's pitch black. We're in the coastal range of British Columbia. It's steep as hell. And we're in this clear cut. The Canadians call them cut blocks, but basically it's where a logging company went through and clear cut the trees. The hunter had shot this bear along the logging road, cut deep into the hillside above us. We picked up a bit of blood at impact but the bear bailed down off the road, beeline into the bottom of it, just this nasty hell hole. And if you haven't been to coastal British Columbia, it's crazy thick. So wounded bear, somewhere in this beastly foliage, no blood, and it's as dark as a bag of black cats. From a hunting guide's perspective, this is an awful situation, but I catch a break. I noticed this faint sound on the wind. It's probably a thousand yards plus below us. I really couldn't have imagined the bear going that far. We get some protection from the wind. I hear the death moan of a bear. And it's... We literally sprint down into this nasty shit. It's so thick that we know that if we don't find that bear before it dies, we're gonna be up shit creek. Tracking the moan we get within 100 yards and are able to pinpoint where the bear is. The moral of the story is that if we were only focused on blood in that situation, 100% we would have walked away from that bear and lost it. There is an infatuation with blood tracking, looking for blood of wounded animals and following it. It's intuitive for hunters to think that way, I get it. But those hunters out there who only focus on blood, they're going to lose three to four times the number of animals versus other trackers who are using variables beyond blood. If you have no clue who I am, my name's Cliff Gray. I spent the past decade guiding and outfitting some of the most remote wilderness in North America. My insights and strategies in these videos are based on that data set and experience. All I hope is that you guys get some value from them. If you do, do me a huge favor and like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also jump on my website, PursuitWithCliff.com and sign up for my newsletter. So let's jump right back into using your ears instead of your eyes while tracking as we did in this wounded bear story. Elk in the timber, rams running across shell, bears busting brush, they're all loud. We take this for granted because we are used to these animals being so quiet, close to silent when we're hunting them. But when they're wounded, it's a different story. With bull elk, it's extreme. A single wounded bull in the timber can sometimes sound like a whole herd of elk. Regardless, you still have to be listening and not bullshitting or celebrating after the shot to hear these animals. There's actually a pretty cool analogy when it comes to spear fishing and free diving that really relates. You're diving, you dive down, you hold your breath, you line up your shot on a giant fish, and to your amazement, you hit it perfectly. You fin to the surface for obvious reasons, right? You need to breathe, but you instead yell at your friend in excitement when you hit the surface. You wanna tell them about the shot, and then you pass out and die. It happens a lot, unfortunately, these blackouts. In all the excitement, we forget what the real priority is, and that misjudgment can have huge consequences. Every rifle or archery shot is the same. Fight the urge to talk right after the shot. After taking a shot, listen and silently prepare for the next shot. That first 30 seconds is a critical time to get information. Elk crashing through the timber, then silence, that sometimes indicates a bull that just tipped over dead. Crashing through the timber and then a slow walk, a branch cracking here and there, that may be a bull going down and bedding. A lot of times the bear will moan or they'll roll like a dog gnawing back on its wound. They scuffle with themselves. You can hear that. Try to make notes in your mind on what you hear during this critical time. Did they bed? What direction did it sound like they were headed in? Try to pinpoint the exact location of where you heard the wounded animal last. That's really important. Just like making sure you know the exact spot of the animal when you took the shot, you want to key in on that last spot you heard the animal moving. That gives you really important information Information, particularly if the tracking job becomes a struggle fest. During any waiting you do between the shot and when you start pursuing the animal, it's critical that you try to listen as much as possible, even outside of that first 30 to 60 seconds. You know, I've had situations where five, six minutes later, I pick up something moving. In the story I told at the beginning of this video, I mean, I didn't hear the bear moan until four hours after it was shot. So there's always the opportunity 
to listen and pick up something that's gonna give you critical information to help you find that animal when you're tracking it. I'll say this several times in this video, you're hunting until you literally touch the unresponsive eyeball of that animal. Keep that mantra in your mind, I'm still hunting after the shot. We're still trying to pick up information. All right, so a question I get a lot, how long do I wait after shooting an animal to follow up and start tracking it? The reason people ask is it seems simple, it's just a quantifiable thing. You can hit your watch with what Cliff told you or what Jim Bob told you and you feel like you're doing the right thing. People want to say that X minutes for Y type of shot is correct, but it just really isn't reality. How long you wait after a shot is a trade-off and you're gonna wait certain things differently based on the variables in your situation. The first obvious variable we have to consider after the shot is time. Can you wait overnight? You have to assume that you're gonna be gutting this animal the next day at 10 or 11 a.m. if you wait overnight. So the first question is, will the temperatures allow for this and still allow you to recover the meat? The second thing we have to think about is trip logistics. Are we leaving the next morning? Is there a plane on the way? People don't like to talk about this. It's almost dirty, you know? It's dirty to think that someone would half-ass a tracking job or put a successful recovery at risk due to the logistics, but it's a reality. We all have lives and we all have pissed off wives, so we have to consider this. Now to the part that there's huge debate about, right? What did we observe from the animal at the shot and the immediate movement afterwards. Was it clear that the bull or buck was gut shot? Is the bull headed straight uphill? Is the animal headed you know, towards property lines that are relevant? What is the likelihood from what you saw at the shot that the animal's gonna go bed down? What is the topography like? What is the vegetation like? All of this stuff factors in to how long I wait. But here's some general rules of thumb. For wounded animals that I'm pretty sure are gut shot, or I know they've bedded, or I think they're about to bed, I don't pursue them at night if they've been shot in the afternoon. If that same situation occurred in the morning, I'll generally give them three to four hours. And the theme on those animals is what I said earlier, we're still hunting. So I'm spot and stalking back into them if possible. I'll get into this later on strategies and approaching bedded game, but that's where I take that situation. The worst thing you can do is bump a wounded animal that's gut shot or has already bedded down once. That might be your only chance. If I see that a wounded animal is going straight uphill or I know it's truly marginally hit, I don't wait around. I'll run to kill them right now. A wounded bull elk that's headed straight uphill is the epitome of this. I don't care how confident you were in the shot. If that bull is headed uphill, you need to grasp this moment and go get another angle and get another shot at that animal right now. Do not wait a second. Run until you throw up if you have to, if you've gotta go get to another ridge, but you've gotta get to a position where you can shoot until you run out of bullets and kill that wounded bull. Those bulls that go uphill, I cannot tell you how many times I've spent hours and days tracking them to no avail. The other thing for this situation, if you know the country and you can move to a position where you have a clear look at the exit path, and that may even be getting in the truck and moving positions where you know those animals are gonna squirrel out in a minute, go do that, don't wait. Go get that shot opportunity. We aren't talking about animals that are gonna bed anytime soon or that are gut shot or anything like that. We're talking about animals that are marginally hit and this is your chance. Hunters are generally too confident at taking shots at unwounded animals, you know, healthy animals out there. They shoot too far, they shoot too quickly. But on the other side of things, hunters are too timid about shooting that game that are already wounded. Let them have it. Get those animals killed when you have the opportunity. I mentioned earlier how vegetation comes into play here. Bears that are running for crazy thick brush, I feel the same way as I do about bull elk headed uphill. Move now and get another shot if possible. When they hit that thick stuff, the chances of recovery on a bear drops 50%. So try to get them stopped before they hit that type of vegetation. So the other situation that a lot of folks think about when we're talking about waiting periods between shot and when you start tracking is when we think we've made a pretty good hit, 
but we really don't have much information after the shot, right? The animal pretty much just disappeared, you know, into the vegetation, into the topography, and we don't have a lot of information of what's going on, but we generally think it was a pretty good hit. In those situations, I like to wait for 20 or 30 minutes. In the last situation when it comes to asking this question is what if the animal hits the ground in sight? We literally knock it on its ass in our sight, right? In those situations, first, I always tell hunters, and I implement this myself, if the animal has its head up off the ground, its nose out of the dirt, shoot it until it doesn't. I've seen several bull elk, several bucks, get up after getting knocked on their ass and then vanish when the hunters are just putting their stuff together and start down the trail and they look over and the animal's gone. I'll generally watch the animal for three, five, six, seven minutes before packing my stuff up and making my way over there, even if I think it's completely dead. And a lot of times how this actually goes down, the animal hit the deck, we see it, and now the hunter is talking to his buddies or he's talking to his guide or whatever. But the best thing to do during those discussions is keep an eye on the animal, out of the corner of your eye or whatever. It's okay to kind of start planning logistically, but watch because those animals sometimes will get up and move and you wanna make sure you watch that. One of the worst feelings is to have an animal hit the deck and then start doing something and realize that the animal got up and moved while you weren't looking. Because now it's kind of the worst case scenario. Not only is the animal that you thought was dead, now that's turned into a tracking job, but it's even worse because now you have no information about where that animal went, right? You weren't listening, you weren't watching, you didn't see the direction of travel, you didn't see the last point where he was. So in some ways, now you have less information than you would have if the animal just would have run off at the shot. So that's the rundown from my perspective in terms of how long I'll usually wait between shot and tracking job. But I know a lot of you have differing opinions on that. So please put it in the comments. You guys are hunting different species, different topography, different vegetation than I've been exposed to. So all that knowledge is useful. Please put it in the comments for everybody to check out. We're gonna touch on the basics and then I'm gonna jump into some tracking tactics that you rarely hear discussed but they'll really help you up your odds in terms of finding wounded game. So first, the dirty little secret is that 10 to 20% of situations called misses actually result in unfound dead animals. If you take anything away from this video, take that thought away. So here's a rhyme for you. Blood infatuation leads to no explanation and a lot of frustration. At its worst, it causes undue rationalization. God, I'm an idiot for making up that rhyme. I saw the dirt blow up behind him. Now that I think about it, I missed. The bull just walked off. I didn't hit him. I must have just skimmed him. These are all things I've heard people say when they can't find blood and they're frustrated trying to track an animal. I'm gonna stick a link to my last video. It's either gonna be over here or here. I always get it confused, but somewhere here, the title of that video is Severe Game Violations Made by Honest Hunters. The comments are super useful on this subject. Literally dozens of situations where we think we missed, but we actually didn't. So that leads us to the subject of shot analysis. My first recommendation is to video through a phone scope or a mag scope because what you'll realize is that mental recall at the shot isn't close to the accuracy of video. Just as an exercise, if you can, try to video some hunts, you will be amazed the difference between your perspective at the shot as a spotter or a shooter and that perspective versus what you got through the video on a spotter. Particularly when it comes to shot splatter, dust, snow, all that stuff, angles matter a ton. The recoil of the rifle and the minute moment of not seeing what's going on can really trick you. I'm a little finicky about discussing the details of what a hit looks like or animal behavior after the shot, because I have so little confidence in it. These are general things that I notice about animals, but they're not always true. Usually a bursting sprint from an animal is an indicator of a hit. Or if the animal is bracing, right? Like trying to stay up, that's obviously a hit. Loose limbs, erratic movement, those are all obvious signs of a hit. The other thing you'll see sometimes is flopping limbs. And this is an obvious indicator of a hit, but the quality of the hit and where you hit 
it's actually kind of difficult to tell from flopping limbs. This is particularly the case with shoulder shots. You can shoot an animal through the shoulder and if it doesn't drop them, they're still able to use their shoulders. A lot of times it can be a very good hit, right? You could have double lunged the animal, but most of the structure in the shoulder is still there, so they're moving off. But you've hit connective tissue, you've hit ligaments, and you'll see this weird kind of flopping in their gait. And a lot of times that flopping, that erratic flopping that is actually just tendons that have been destroyed up high in the shoulder, that looks like you've hit the animal down low. So sometimes these shots that are very good shots, like that animal is walking dead. It's got a bullet or arrow, you know, straight through both lungs, but it looks like you've hit it very low because the, the animal's dangling its foot. Just consider that that's not always a horribly hit animal. Sometimes that's a great hit animal. It's just showing this kind of weird behavior because you've destroyed some of that soft tissue in there. Another decent indicator to pay attention to, particularly in the mountains, is if the animal drastically changes elevation after the shot. In the mountains, this is a great indicator. An animal going downhill is usually hit. An animal going uphill is typically missed or hit poorly. If the animal is in a group of animals and he's lagging, can't keep up to their elevation, he's starting to switch back, his buddies are bombing straight uphill that animal is probably hit but again don't read into these indicators as set in stone rules i've seen walking dead bulls bugle grab a mouthful of grass look around act like nothing happened and then a second later tip over stone cold dead all right so let's jump into the simple scenario of a good blood trail there's blood at impact and, you've, and it's followed up immediately by steady blood this is almost always a lower 50% of the body cavity hit. There's almost always a decent exit wound on the animal and it's usually down in the lower part of the cavity of the animal. And it's just physics. That's why the blood is already hitting the ground and that's why it's consistent. Trailing this kind of blood trail is pretty intuitive. You know, a couple of tricks are stay to the side of the blood trail, don't trample it. And then if the blood is starting to get more dispersed, get out some flagging tape, mark the last blood that you found, and then mark the next blood that you found. And a lot of times if you line up those flags, you're gonna have a direction of travel. So if you keep going and that blood trail gets a little weaker, and this is pretty common, particularly you know right before you find the animal, and that's a function of the fact that the animal's blood pressure is dropping because it's lost so much blood. So you might find less volume and it might be more dispersed, you know, longer distance between. But if you can line up flagging on the last couple chunks of blood that you found, you'll have a direction to travel. And a lot of times you can just walk that out and find the animal on a good continuous blood trail like that. The other tip that I'll give you on a continuous blood trail, and this is gonna apply to 8% of you guys, 10% of you guys, and you may not even know it. 10% of males are technically colorblind. They're actually shade blind. I, I personally am, am shade blind. All my brothers are also. A lot of times that blindness is reds and greens. So if you're one of those folks, blood trailing can be problematic, particularly in green vegetation. You've got red on green vegetation. Don't focus on the color. You'll get frustrated. Focus more on the wet texture of the blood, right? Or the shine, particularly on a fresh blood trail. For colorblind and shade blind folks, that's gonna be a lot more effective. So if you're the guy who just never can see the blood, there's a very good chance that you're colorblind or shade blind or whatever you wanna call it. And if you start focusing on texture and shininess of the liquid, you're gonna have a lot more success. And even on this ideal situation where you've got continuous blood, hunt the blood trail, continue to hunt the animal. Don't go bumbling down the blood trail, you know, laughing, talking to your buddies and not paying attention. If the animal's not dead, you still wanna take advantage of any opportunity that you get to finish the animal off, easy ways to do that is just always be scanning in front of you. Even if you're look, even if you're looking for blood on the ground, always be scanning in front of you, looking for anything odd on kind of the lower horizon lines. You know, a bump, you know, an antler, a foot, anything weird. Just be scanning for that and scan for movement as you're blood trailing. But one of the keys is be quiet. If you're loud when you're blood trailing, animals get up way further ahead of you and you're just less likely to hear them moving around. A lot of times as you finish up the end of a blood trail, you actually hear the animal, you'll hear him breathing, you'll hear him struggling to breathe, you'll hear him moving a little bit, you'll hear him rustling a little bit, and then you know where the animal is. You wanna hear that 
before you startle them. If you're loud, you can startle them and they'll get up and move off before you've been able to pinpoint them. And that can lead to a bad situation. So be quiet as you go down the trail. All right, so the harder scenario, but it's more common than people think. There's no apparent blood trail, so you think you've missed. There's a scenario of literally no blood at all. You can't find impact blood, you can't find the arrow, you can't find blood on the arrow, right? But then there's a scenario where there's only blood on the arrow, there's only blood at the impact. In most situations, there is blood at the shot, it just might be hard to find. So look high, look low, look at foliage above the animal, look five to 10 yards away, look at the foliage as the animal ran away. A lot of times it might just be a little bit but there's usually impact blood. When it comes to arrows, just consider that, you know, after they go through an animal, they can skip, they can glance, they can get drug away by the animal, hanging out their side. There's a lot of different scenarios you have to consider. And if you think about all those scenarios, you have a better chance of finding that arrow. We wanna find that impact blood, or we wanna find that arrow because it tells us a lot. There's essentially three things to consider when you're looking at your impact blood or a bloody arrow. You wanna consider shit, bubbles and color. So bright red, clean blood is usually muscle or heart. Dark, almost purplish blood, a lot of times liver. Nasty looking blood that's got an odd smell. It might be a little yellow, might be a little green. It might literally have some undigested material in it. It might have some green bile in it. That's usually a gut shot. And then if you have bubbles and froth, you know, a lot on an arrow, this is very evident. If you've got bubbles and froth along that arrow, even a dry arrow, you, you can see where those bubbles popped as the blood dried out. If you have that, that's almost always a lung shot. So those are kind of your indicators when you're actually looking at the blood. And that tells you a lot about how well the animal is hit. And that's very useful because going back to what we just discussed, the amount of time we wait, we can factor this information in and make a good decision about what to do next. The next thing we want to consider in this situation is why there's no legitimate blood trail in the line of travel of the animal. You've probably heard a bunch of different explanations of why sometimes there's not a blood trail. People discuss the length of the hair the toughness of the hide, the fat the animal has, exit holes being plugged by internal organs that are dragged out by the arrow or bullet. And it is true, a lot of that stuff factors in. But in my experience, the number one culprit by far is the angle, height, existence, and size of the exit wound. Check out this entry and exit wound on this wild boar that I shot just a couple weeks ago. I shot this boar at like three or four feet as he was coming towards me and I shot him at a very intense angle as you can see. I use this as an example because you can see that big exit wound. This boar bled like crazy because he had the ideal exit wound. It's not, the, it's not a perfect shot as you can see. I didn't hit much for vital organs, just the one lung. But in terms of laying down a blood trail, this was the extreme case because the exit wound was large and it was way low on the body cavity. This is a situation where animals will bleed a ton and have a very continuous and steady blood trail. However, if you get the opposite situation, an upward angle or a small exit wound or an exit wound that's up high in the body cavity, they may bleed very little and it may be erratic. They may not bleed for the first 100 yards or 200 yards as their body cavity fills up because that blood hasn't got to that large exit wound where it could come out. And then when it does start to come out, depending on those other variables I mentioned at the start, you know, fat, hair, all of that, it might take a while for it to trickle down the hide and actually start hitting the ground. So where that exit wound is, the angle of it, the height of it on the body cavity, that's the number one factor. In archery situations, if there's no exit wound, it's usually because of shot placement. There's other variables, you know, arrow weight, draw weight, the energy that's coming out of the bow, but mostly it's shot placement. You can zip a sharp broadhead through a bull with a 45 pound bow if you hit the right spot. The explanation for no exit wound on rifles can be a little more complicated. I'm not an expert here, so if you are, make sure and comment because you can probably add some additional information. The fact you don't get an exit wound usually has more to do with bullet construction than it does to do with shot placement or caliber. All the common calibers in big game hunting at reasonable distances are still capable of going straight through an animal 
pretty much regardless of where you hit them. So if you're not getting exit wounds and you want them, the first thing to look at is the construction of the bullet you're using in your rifle. Not necessarily the caliber or how far you're shooting or shot placement. There are many bullets on the market now and a lot of them are the high ballistic coefficient bullets out there. They're actually built to not exit the animal. And the concept there is that all of the energy from the bullet is going into the animal. We don't want wasted energy exiting the animal through an exit wound and the, and the bullet retaining itself and going through the animal. We want all the energy to be in that impact of the bullet hitting the animal. So some bullets are constructed for that purpose. So keep that in mind. For blood trailing, obviously we want an exit wound, but there is a trade-off there. If the bullet is made to impact the animal and all the energy transfer into the animal, then it's not gonna leave a good exit wound for trailing. On the other extreme, if the bullet just doesn't even, you know, it doesn't even mushroom at all, it doesn't tear apart at all, and it just zips right through the animal, and there's not a whole lot of energy transfer, then yeah, it's gonna leave an exit wound, be it a small exit wound, but it will leave an exit wound in a blood trail, but there's not gonna be that transfer of energy. And there are a couple type of hits that just don't bleed well, even if there is an exit wound. You know, high hits that aren't arterial, backstrap hits, high hits in the diaphragm. I already mentioned this, they're just up high, so they don't bleed for a while because you gotta have buildup of blood. And the thing is, is I've also just looked at wounds and I have no idea why they didn't bleed that well. They happen to just not hit anything huge in the vascular system, right? They didn't hit an artery, they didn't hit much for veins and the animal's dead, but it didn't bleed a lot, that could just be random in a sense. And just because you have a lot of blood to track, it doesn't mean you have a great hit. A lot of blood is a good indicator that it's a fatal hit due to just the blood loss eventually, but you might have just got lucky. I've seen several ass hits on elk over the years, you know, down in the lower leg. If there's no blood, you aren't gonna find them. They're just gonna get away. If there's lots of blood, it's almost as good as a double lung shot. You've hit that femoral artery, they're gonna die and they're gonna die quick. The reason all of this is important is it gives you an understanding of what's going on and there's always this handicapping going on when it comes to tracking. You know, is it a good hit? Was it a bad hit? Was it a miss? We use all of these metrics to decide how much effort and resources we're gonna put into this tracking job. It regulates how hard we're gonna push it. For 95% of hunters, there's way too much excitement on heavy bleeding situations, and there's way too little time spent on non-bleeding tracking jobs. The lack of blood is an excuse to quit in general, a good blood trail is a reason to quit hunting while you're trailing and get excited and bump wounded game. If there's great blood, keep your excitement in check. If there's no blood, consider that you still might have a dead game animal. It might just take a little more effort to find it. Comment if you've had a situation with a lack of blood but a mortally hit animal. Tell the story here. The stories you guys put in the comments teach me and everyone else a ton. The tracking skill set takes experience and repetition. Every situation includes a multitude of variables, and that's probably why this video seems like it's all over the place. There's just a ton of variables that we have to consider when tracking animals. But the stories you guys put in the comments, it's like you're packaging up knowledge for everyone's benefit. I love them, so please keep doing that. Oh, and guys, I wanna mention something that's kind of related to the comment section in the community, and that's this hat I'm wearing, right? So a couple of viewers out there sent me this hat with a couple other hats. And they also sent me a really nice handwritten note. It's a couple brothers who are entrepreneurs and they started this apparel business. And it also sounds like they're crazy enough to try to get into outfitting. But anyways, all that's good stuff. And I think it's a cool design. I'll put their Instagram in the description of this video. If you wanna support a couple guys that are within kind of the channel's community, go buy a hat from them. I don't get anything if you buy one. They didn't ask me to do this. Okay, so no blood tracking, dry tracking. Let's dig in here. Note the direction of travel of the animal. A lot of times wounded game, will jump on a game trail and they'll go directly down that game trail. Other times, they'll just kind of basically go straight and beeline straight, particularly if they're going downhill or they've got some sort of escape route already figured in their mind, they're gonna beeline straight for it. One thing to note here is you can visually see the direction of travel of a wounded animal when you take the shot. And once you get over there to where the animal is standing, you have a perception of what direction you know they took 
but it's pretty difficult because you know all the topography kind of distorts what you're looking at. So one way to make sure you actually start tracking the way the, act the, anim the animal actually went is if you have a spotter, you got a hunting partner, you've got a guide with you, whatever, you've got somebody that you can leave at the spot of the shot with a spotting scope, with a radio if it's legal, and they can communicate with you and you can actually start to take the path that you think the animal went on, they can tell you via the radio or they can sign to you or whatever, and they can tell you like, yeah, you're on the right path. That's a good way to do that. It's very easy to get over there. You know, I've talked about this in other videos where it's actually sometimes hard to even find the spot where the animal was standing when you took the shot because it just looks so much different when you actually get over there to the area where the animal was. But it's even harder to tell what actual direction of travel the animal went into. You saw it go a certain way, but once you're over there, it can actually be fairly difficult to translate that into an actual direction. But if you've got a spotter, they can tell you like, yeah, you're taking the same path that the animal did after the shot. In certain conditions, you'll be able to pick up the track of the wounded animal. In scenarios where there's a lot of animals around, there's a, you know, it's a, it's a buck that was with other bucks, it's a bull elk that's with a whole herd of elk, then it can be pretty tricky for a couple reasons. One, those animals are usually in an area where they've been spending time over the last few days, so you've got a lot of overlapping tracks, and you've got a lot of history of tracks there. And the other thing is the animal was with a group of animals, and at least for some distance, he may have tried to stick with those other animals. So it's hard to distinguish which track is the wounded animal. If you have to resort to just tracking the whole group of animals, just constantly be looking for a track that drops in elevation. That's usually your wounded animal peeling off from the group. They're just struggling to keep up with the elevation gain of their buddies and they start to drop off and that's a very good sign that you can get on that track and you're gonna be on the track of the wounded animal. Probably out of all the tracking jobs that I've done over the last five or six years, a fourth to a fifth of those tracking jobs have, done, have been done just that way, on no blood at all, just on tracking the animal. Using the location of the animal, the direction of travel, and then on the ground, dry tracking. A couple other hints when you're doing this, consider that wounded animals feel constrained by obstacles a lot more than unwounded animals. So they'll hit an edge and they'll follow it. And they'll typically follow it downhill as I've mentioned before. And these obstacles could be fence lines, cliff bands, creeks, an animal that they would just hop through the nastiest terrain will now meander around looking for an opening in the rock. You'll see that with mountain goats when they're wounded, right? They'll jump around those rocks no problem. When they're not wounded, when they're wounded, they'll be much more careful. On fence lines, a lot of times they'll hit it and they'll just start walking along the fence line. They just know they don't have the capacity to jump. So you'll just see them, sometimes this happens with antelope that are wounded, they'll hit a fence line and they don't wanna to struggle to get underneath it like they usually do. So they'll just turn and they'll just start walking Walking, a lot of times at a slow weird pace and they can travel a ton of distance and that can throw people off because they think oh an antelope like it just went right under that fence and keeps going straight in the line of travel but actually the antelope is up the fence line four or five hundred yards because it's turned on that obstacle and started walking the other thing is some species in particular really want to get to water when they're wounded in mule deer and elk i don't always see this but I do notice it with wild pigs for some reason. They will almost always beeline to water if it's in the vicinity. All right, so now some tactics on when you're tracking what you think is a bedded animal or you think you're getting relatively close to an animal you're tracking. As I've mentioned before, you're still hunting, so keep your volume down. Move as quietly as possible. Move as diligently as possible and always be looking. A lot of times the last 10% of tracking jobs those are really the highest consequence stocks in hunting. Your opportunity to stop the suffering is now. Stocks on unwounded animals don't have that overhang. If you blow it, really no major consequences, right? In the spectrum of life, the animal's just gonna get away. But if you botch stocks and tracking on wounded game, you might be inflicting pure misery on an animal for an additional multiple days. So there's real consequences there. So one of my favorite strategies when I sense that I'm on my last 10% of a tracking job or I just have a good idea that there's a bedded wounded animal somewhere in the vicinity, I'll use what I call J-hooking. In this concept, you'll, you'll actually see bucks and bulls do this. They'll be going down a trail and then as they decide to bed, what they'll do is they'll J-hook off the trail and they'll get up with a little elevation 
where they can look at their back trail, but they can also see in front of them. They can just see around, but they'll J-hook up off the trail. When I'm tracking wounded animals and I sense that we're getting close or there's an indicator that we are close to that animal, I'll start J-hooking. And so I'll get, I'll constantly be looking for any situation where I can get some elevation, right? And maybe, maybe it's a couple feet, maybe it's 50 feet of elevation. Even a little elevation helps. You want to J-hook off the trail and get up on elevation and then glass up in front of you where you're going and then if you're track if you're tracking a dry trail and you don't have any blood glass back from where you came from just like a bull or buck does when he's trying to see if anything's coming up the trail at him look back because a lot of times if you don't have any blood to go off of you've actually passed the bedded animal right so look back use that elevation to look back look forward and do that periodically. You wanna be really conservative. Go 30 yards and then get, get good elevation and look in there. Go 10 feet, look in there. It's much better to do that than to jump a wounded animal and you're in thick brush and you can't see them. If you get that animal up when you don't have any, when you can't see anything, there's a much higher chance you just triple the length of your tracking job and maybe even create a situation where you're not gonna recover the animal. You wanna use that J-hook pattern to keep looking down in there until you see until you see the animal and you can end the tracking job unless it's bears bears have a tend to hole up and cover and they can be very hard to find but her ungulates you know it's it's odd when you're glassing they'll be showing their bellies they'll be in awkward positions and you'll see colors on them that you usually won't see on just a healthy bedded animal they'll just be laying oddly so a lot of times they're actually fairly easy to glass up also if you're seeing other game animals as you do this Pay attention to their mannerisms. Perfectly healthy game animals that are unwounded, if they if they have a wounded animal around them, they'll be much more alert. And they'll be and they'll, a lot of times they'll actually be looking at that animal. They'll be looking at that animal struggling to keep up with them. They'll be looking at that animal struggling in the brush. And you might not be able to see the wounded animal, but if you're observing the healthy animals and watching their mannerisms, a lot of times they know something's wrong and they'll give off indicators of where where that wounded animal is and I failed to mention this when I was talking about you know at the shot opportunity but this can happen a lot right when you shoot at an animal if you lose that sight picture for a moment if there's other animals around that you weren't shooting at take a look at those animals and see what they're doing a lot of times they'll be looking at the wounded animal my wife's desert ram was the epitome of that she shot the ram and it disappeared like we had no idea where it went there's a lot of topography there we thought it might have bee lined up we thought she might have missed we had no idea but we started watching the other rams and all the other rams were looking down kept looking down they would move and then they would look down and come to find out they were looking at my wife's ram that had stumbled and fallen down in this crevasse so they were telling us exactly where her ram was i've seen very similar things within groups of deer and elk so pay attention to what those other animals are doing so it's likely that eventually you're going to run into a situation where you have to go into thick cover you just can't see the animal outside of that so a note on safety here. So the rule I always go by, if it's thick brush, one gun, and that applies to archery too, one archer. Particularly with bears, pigs, any animal that's not gonna necessarily exit always away from you, that is how people get shot. If there's multiple people in the brush with the, with the wounded animal, even if the animal doesn't pose a direct threat to them, the fact that it could exit between them puts those individuals at risk. That's how people inadvertently get shot. I cringe when I see videos or hear about multiple guys going into the brush with multiple rifles or bows. If you look at the history of guides getting killed or hunting partners killing each other, this is up on the list. Thick stuff is a one-man show. There's no other way to do it safe. So one guy goes in and kills the animal. All right, folks, so I hope all those tips and tricks were helpful to you. If they were, please like the video and subscribe. If you have anything to add, throw it down in the comments. Like I said before, you guys are a ton of help to everybody out there. Also, check out that recent game violations video I did. This video and that video have a lot of overlap, but they're also both on topics. Discussion itself helps a lot of folks out and helps a lot of folks avoid problems in the future. Thanks for watching, folks. Good luck out there.